So very nice to see everybody here. Thank you very much for hanging around for the last day and the last uh, keynote and then a few set of sessions. So I'm going to talk to you about Ballerina and uh, not really about Ballerina, but about what it means, why we're doing it, and things like that. Uh, we had a whole set of sessions about Ballerina. If you wanted to learn a bit more about it, uh, uh, they're kind of done, but there are a lot of people hanging around, so you can always talk to people, talk to me, talk to anybody. Uh, and I'm not really getting, getting into the syntax of the language or details, but more at a high level about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it's going to impact you. Right? So these are the questions that you hopefully have a, a concrete answer to by the time I'm done. And if you don't, um, hang around. You can always ask for more. All right, so why are we doing ballerina? Let's start with that. Uh, you know, when you start something like this, you have to always under, you know, because it's a, it's a big problem we want to solve, and I'll get into more about that. So why in the world are we doing it? <clears throat> well, the answer is simple, uh, because it's time to make integration great again. You know, integration is an important problem, it's not going to go anywhere, and we want to make it wonderful again. Um, so let me expand a little bit about that, what, what that really means. What's happening today is that Everything that we do uh, is becoming part of the network. It is not, it's no longer the case that you worry about sharing code by taking something else, linking it, and building something, running it. Now we worry about connecting some things over the network. Tyler mentioned in his keynote in the morning on, on the first day on Monday that there are 286,000 SaaS applications around. Uh, I don't know how Gartner managed to count that, but you know, Gartner loves to come up with these kind of wonderful round numbers. Not quite round, so it sounds credible, but it's great. There's a lot. We all know there's a lot. So that's really the new shared library. If you want to get something done, you call an API. Right? That's how it works today. And, and uh, uh, so that means there's a lot of these things that we have to work with all the time. Second, if you, want, if you make something, if you want to create something, and you want to not be forgotten, you have to make your capabilities available. Yesterday when Seshi talked, if you were at her keynote, uh, um, or, or during the, the session, I can't remember afterwards, one of the two, there was a conversation about how most of the financial service third party uh, providers ask you to provide your credentials because they go and screen scrape from those systems, right? So everything you provide, somebody else wants to consume. So, so the idea that whatever capabilities you write, you always expect someone else to be consuming it. So serve or be forgotten, basically. If nobody wants to consume it except a human being, it's kind of boring because anything that a human being does, there will be some system that comes along in the future and wants to improve it. So they need to get access to it. So serve or be forgotten. The other part is the agile theme that, again, Tyler touched upon when he talked about talked in the morning. Uh, the, the need to be agile fundamentally comes down to saying, I don't know what I want to do tomorrow. And that means I should be able to take the atomic components I have and twist them around, turn them around, build another one, and then build another one the day after, and build another one the day after. So, so to get to be an agile environment, an agile organization, you have to be able to recompose and recompose and recompose till there's no end to it. Right? Uh, so that's really a big, uh, so these are, to me, the driving forces as to why the problem of integration is, is really has to become great again, because it, it's a big problem that needs to be solved in an in a absolutely elegant way, in an absolutely reliable way, and, and a scalable way. <clears throat> so of course, why not use ESPs, right? We have one, I think we sell, call an ESP, or call Enterprise Integrator now. So why not use that one? Uh, well, the problem is it's kind of too hot and heavy for the coming world. Uh, uh, so the coming world is, is going to be a, all about microservices, serverless, containers, everything small, everything recomposed, everyone doing something over and over again, and so forth. A, and, and the ESB concept was designed at a different era, diff designed for a different era. So if you take our ESB, which is the best ESB in the market if you're looking for one, if you take that one and you boot it up, it takes a minimum of 30 seconds to boot up. And if you install a few things into it, if you install you know, 10, 20 services to it, it'll take 40, 50 seconds to boot up, which is not a very micro kind of architecture. It's not, it, of course, it can run in a container. We have many customers who run the ESB in a container. Don't get me wrong. But it's not really the suitable architecture for this very light, um, rapidly changing world that we want to uh, go forward with. Second problem with ESPs primarily is that the way you program them is using some kind of a, a DSL, some kind of an XML language, some other syntax, whatever, it doesn't matter. Some kind of a domain-specific language, and with a bunch of hacks to make it work. Right? Because the, the language approach is not, not and I'm going to get more into this, uh, is not really suitable for programming arbitrary things. So that's why I said hacks galore. You have to hack this part around this and the other part around that to make it all work. Right? 
So this is the future, but just to be clear, that's in the future. Today you have to keep buying the ESP, it's awesome, right? So just, I'm gonna get killed by our sales guys if I don't say that. Uh, so this is all future stuff. So, um, so that's, why you sh that's why ESBs are not really the end game of how this problem is gonna get solved as we go along. But then, uh, let's talk about the, the other aspect that I touched upon at the end of the ESP, this idea of DSLs and configuration over code. Uh, so this has this been mantra in, in software engineering for many years, this idea of configuration over code. What that means is, well, it was hard to get a program written, tested, deployed, you know, all of that stuff, it would take months. That's why you buy some big system that has a configuration language, and you buy the system, and then you just configure it, and it comes up much faster. Right? ESBs came up in that time frame. Uh, and there are DSLs, domain-specific languages, and so forth, all are focused on that capability, right? making it easy to configure something and bring it up fast. Uh, well, the, the problem is, uh, well, not the problem, so f the first thing is, while DSLs and these config systems uh, were running around doing stuff, a code caught up, right? Uh, if you, if you, I'm sure you've heard the story about Facebook. In Facebook, if, uh, if the, the developers make a change to the source code and they push a commit in, and if the commit runs and passes all the tests, it gets instantly deployed to the internal Facebook uh, servers the, for the employees. Right? They don't push it all the way out, which is probably a good thing given the scale of Facebook. But they push it out immediately to all the internal people. Right? So, so code change no longer is a thing that code change means, oh, come back in six months and we'll get it up and running for you. Right? Uh, we had customers in, in, our, in, in the early days, now it's much better because of Amazon like mindset, uh, even within enterprises, uh, who would say, well, I got this thing done in a week, now I have to wait for nine months to order the machine, get it into the data center, get it provisioned, get it security approved, and then get access to the darn thing so I can install the software and actually use it. Right. Uh, this is, of course, Amazon has eaten that part of the problem, but still, uh, so, so uh, what, what SDLC tools, the software development lifecycle tools have done, continuous integration, continuous testing, continuous deployment, is basically to cut that time down to essentially zero. You write the code and you're up and running. Uh, but DSS and ESPs are not that mindset, because to test one of these things, you have to bring up this whole server. Right? So, so it's much more expensive to, to be able to do lifecycle management. Uh, they were not designed for that stuff. Code is designed, version control with Git and GitHub or whatever you want to use, uh, SVN, etc. works perfectly well, but it doesn't work so well with massive uh, language uh, configuration files. And also configuration files don't have any modularity. Uh, even, even our ESP language, I'm, uh, you know, I'm being openly critical of our own history, uh, even if you look at our own ESP language, it's not that easy to modularize a big configuration and have multiple people working on it and then build a complete thing at the end of it. Right? The way it's easy with source code, it's not really possible. And it's not only us. All the products have the same problem because they were not designed with that mindset. Uh, that's why a, a configuration over code, in my mind, is over. And it's really time to make code great again, and for even for integration to bring code back onto the front page. So, okay, so if you're talking about code, of course you have to ask, well, there are a bazillion programming languages, why not use all of those, or any of those, or some of those? Uh, I'm just picking on a few of them, Java, Node.js, Python, but what, my argument applies to all of these things. A, a, uh, programming languages are wonderful, we, we ourselves program with many of these, obviously, a, but the, the problem is all of these programming languages were designed for programming and not for network integration. None of these programming languages have native understanding of three things that fundamentally are everywhere if you write a network application today, which is data in the form of some kind of a relation, some kind of SQL-like structure. Maybe not relational, you're no SQL fan, no problem. Tabular data, let's agree on that. Tabular data is not going anywhere. XML and JSON, right? Uh, this is how you communicate with everybody else. This is how you send data, this is how you get a response. Uh, this is the format. But a, a, if you are a Java programmer, I'm sure you're familiar with Jackson or JSON uh, for how you handle with, with JSON, right? If you're familiar with XML, you're, you're, you're doing stacks or SACs or uh, DOM or whatever. None of them are pleasant programming experience for either Java, either XML or JSON. They're very painful. Uh, just to create a simple document and do something, it takes you lines and lines of code. And by the time you're done with it, it's like, oh my god, how many freaking lines do I have to put to say, just stick a node into a tree? 
right? Uh, that's, that, that's a reality. Right? And that's simply because, it's not because the people who design that stuff are dumb or anything like that. Of course not. They're brilliant people. It's simply because the metaphor and the abstraction level of those programming languages were not designed for this problem. They were designed for object-oriented type systems, and they're wonderful at that. Right? Uh, second part is asynchronous programming and really parallel programming as well. They suck at it, to put it in simple terms. Because that's, again, not the programming model. You can program asynchronously. Node, wonderful asynchronous programming language, right? Programming framework on top of JavaScript. Uh, I think if you heard Paul's keynote, he said he wrote his uh, thesis project in Node. Uh, when he wants to add another feature that takes him five minutes to add, it takes him six months to go figure out how the hell the program works now. Right? That's, that's not BS. That's how Node, look at some Node code and you'll, you'll believe it. Uh, if you want to see the Node equivalent in Java, go and look at Vertex. Uh, awesome, powerful, beautiful, asynchronous, etc. But uh, make sure you have a couple of beers and a bunch of coffees around with you because you're going to be up for a while to get through that code. Uh, it, and it's not, again, it's because the, the metaphor of the language and the problem it's trying to solve are fundamentally mismatched. And when you do that, you can solve it, of course. You know, these are Turing compute programming languages. We can program anything with any of these. But it becomes ugly and not clean. Uh, the last point is network resiliency. I'm sure everybody's heard about something called Hysterix, right? It's historically popular these days. It's awesome. It's a library from Netflix to help you write uh, more resilient Java applications. Uh, things like Circuit Breaker and a bunch of things that's in that library. Uh, uh, why do you need Hysterix? Well, because uh, when you write a Java program, if you, if you want to make the program work reliably, which in the internet world we know means sometimes connections drop. And when connections drop, you don't say, oh my god, world's over, we are done, we are going home. No, you can't do that. You just said, try it again. Right? This is like the rule number one of tech support, right? Did you try it again, madam? You know, press F5 and see whether it works, right? Usually it works. And, and that, unfortunately, when you write code, there's no human being to press F5. You have to program the damn thing. And most developers don't program the F5 because it's painful. Right? And that's why you need something like Hysterix. Hysterix is focused on some other variations of resiliency, but it doesn't matter. Uh, fundamentally, writing network resilient programs in a normal programming language is fundamentally hard. Uh, again, not designed for that. Uh, the abstractions are not suitable for that. Right? So this is why I believe uh, these languages are not going to solve the problem that we need to solve in order to make code great again, for, to make integration great again. That's why we're creating Ballerina. So Ballerina is a new programming language. It's a language which has a completely different metaphor for how you think about programming. It's done with sequence diagrams, not the way any of the other programming languages have been done. And it's designed to make the problem that we want to solve awesome. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ballerina. I'm not talking about the language syntax or the status. I just want to give you an overview of where we are and what's coming up a little bit and, and what, we are, uh, what kind of things we are working on. Uh, so again, if you haven't heard what Ballerina is, this is what Ballerina is. It's a programming language. It's an event-driven parallel programming language for networked applications. Um, it can be used to program anything. You can write a compiler. You can write anything with it. We don't recommend that. That's not what it's for. Uh, languages, a, a programming languages tend to, be, uh, tend, to tend to have spaces for which they're awesomely applicable and other spaces for which you can use it, but it's not the great thing to do. Right? Ballerina has its scope as well in that same way. Uh, we also have a, a unusual model of having both a textual syntax and a graphical syntax. And we have a reason for that because of this sequence diagram metaphor. Sequence diagrams are things you instantly understand when you see a picture. And with Ballerina, we have taken great pains to design the language so that the, the graphic representation and the text representation are one and the same. That is, they both serialize into the same representation. There is no hidden graphical representation. And second, it doesn't lose any parity, so that you can actually program with the graphic representation without losing anything. And we, we'll, we'll, uh, we want to keep working on this, but that's uh, the idea. Um, the type system, the, this is the fundamental thing that solves many of the problems with XML and JSON and SQL and so forth. Ballerina has a type system that was designed from the beginning to address those kind of needs. So it understands those data types. We've taken great pains to try to come up with a, a better data model for XML, a better data model for JSON, one that marries deeply with the type system of the programming language, because it is part of the type system of the programming language. It is not a foreign type, basically. Uh, and doing a lot of work with improving how you can handle connectivity, resiliency, and so forth. I, I'll, I'll mention a few more things about this, but not, not in detail in this presentation. 
Uh, finally, it's designed for modern programming practices. When you write code today, it's not the way we used to write code 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Everybody shares stuff. People write a piece of code, chuck it into a repository, other people take it and use it. Uh, there has to be versioning, there has to be a way of uh, uh, labeling things, naming things, all of that we've taken into account. Documentation, uh, we're taking a lot of religious positions about how to write code. Uh, if you were in Aziz's session at the, at the uh, ballerina track, uh, he mentioned uh, we are looking at things like what, if you're a Java programmer, you, you probably know what find bugs is. It's a Java tool that helps you find bugs in Java code. So one of the things we are trying to do is to basically el eliminate the need for find bugs. Because if a programming to if a tool can find a bug, why can't we make the programming language so that you cannot write the bug at all? Right? So some of those things we are trying to bring into the language, saying we're going to force a programmer to do a certain set of things that make sure that you cannot screw up the program when it works. So it's designed for modern development practices, also taking some strict positions on a bunch of things. Uh, uh, just, to, uh, just to acknowledge the reality, uh, Ballerina is not a bunch of brilliant ideas we came up with. We have, you know, we, we are all students of all kinds of programming languages. Uh, we've, it, it gets massive influence, inspiration, ideas, thoughts, copying from all kinds of different systems, right? So, uh, and, and these are, this is not exhaustive. We've looked at hundreds and hundreds of different things, and we try to distill the right combination of things and make what Ballerina is gonna become, right? And, and this is really how most programming languages are designed. If you go back and look at Java, a skeptic would have looked at Java in 1993 and said, oh, there's nothing new in here. You know, there were threads before, there were classes before, there were inheritance before, blah, 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 and that's all true. But Java won as a programming language because it picked the right combination of features and it merged them in a beautiful architecture in 1993. Right? That was the fundamental reason why Java became such a popular programming language. Uh, Ballerina is trying to do something similar for a different problem. Right? So we, we, we are striving to make all these languages proud of what we come out with. We'll see whether we get there. <coughs> uh, it is work in progress. Again, I want to mention this as well. Uh, we call it 0.95 right now. Uh, because the last one was 9.4, the previous one was 9.3, the previous one was 9.2, this has to be 9.5. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean we are absolutely 95% done. Uh, you know, we might try to slow it down a bit and say 9.51 and 9.52, and then, uh, you know, once you get into a number game, you can keep numbering them any way you want. Uh, we, many things are stable in Ballerina. Many of the fundamental concepts are now stable. Uh, but there are a bunch of things that I, I don't think we are quite there yet. And so we're going to keep iterating a little bit more. So. Uh, 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 so we, are, we want people to try it, we want people to play around with it, we want people to write some serious code with it because that's the only way uh, we'll actually get it right, and we are doing that ourselves. Um, but uh, there are some things that, that are going to change because we, we don't think we've got it all perfectly correct yet. Uh, performance is getting better. Uh, I think we are pretty much faster than Python now, but that's, that's nowhere where we want to be. Uh, uh, for network applications, we are very, very fast. We are faster than any of the Java stuff we've written. Uh, but uh, but for general programming, uh, it's still not quite there yet, and we'll get there. Uh, the editing experience, we have, a, we have a composer we are writing. We also have IDE plugins. Of course, IDE plugins are straightforward IDE plugins, so they have syntax highlighting, debugging, blah, blah, blah. Nothing hard or complicated or unusual there. Uh, the, the editor that we are writing, we want to get it to be a different kind of editing experience, and we are getting better at it. Not, again, not quite there yet, but we'll, we'll get there. <coughs> So I'm going to talk about a few things uh, briefly, uh, just to give you uh, some high-level highlight of uh, fundamental things about Ballerina. I know you can't read that picture. This is a picture of the type system in Ballerina. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, this is the one that makes Ballerina work in terms of uh, being able to program network applications, being able to program a, a, a data-oriented applications, being able to do all of those things in a clean, or organized, not messy way is this stuff, basically. Right? Uh, resiliency is an important one. So resi resiliency basically means when you write a program and you run it, it's going to do what you think it's going to do. Right? And it's going to work reliably in that fashion, not in, you know, sometimes it works, hit F5 for refresh, none of that stuff. Make it work reliably, uh, scalably, and so forth. So there are multiple aspects of resiliency we're working on. So one, first one is around connectors. Uh, connectors are the ones that help a Ballerina programmer interact with a remote API or a remote data source or a remote system of some kind. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things we are building for that. So, so concepts that are in hysterics, for example, are being built into the language. 
uh, and, uh, and and a bunch of other resiliency things that we, we are we are uh, R&Ding and, and getting into the language to make it natural. So when you write a ballerina program, it is naturally resilient. It's not something you have to go and program again and so forth. Let me give you a very tiny example. Uh, if you write transaction database transaction code in Java or any programming language, it is perfectly normal for a database transaction to fail because databases are primarily things that multiple people access and sometimes you have a race condition and you just have to wait till the other one finishes because 100 people are trying to uh, buy the same ticket, right? So someone fails and someone succeeds and then you have to try again. Uh, but that last statement of try again is a pain in the ass to program in, in the Java world. Uh, you have to write a lot of code to make that trial again. Uh, so most of the time, uh, I can tell you from our own code, most of the time we don't do that because it's just painful, so nobody programs that. So you just assume it's going to work, and if it doesn't work, you throw an exception and you get out and you're done. Right? And that's not very good because really there was nothing that went really wrong. Yes, it didn't f uh, succeed the first time, but try again. Uh, so in, in Ballerina, if you do that, if you do a data interaction, a SQL database interaction, it'll automatically try again uh, two times unless you turn that off. Of course, you can turn it off. Uh, and so it'll, it'll assumes that the idea of a transaction failure is perfectly normal, and we'll just try it again. And if it works, well, we're good. Uh, so a bunch of things that we're trying to do. We're also working on a little bit of a funky distributed uh, transaction model. A transaction's a heavy word for that, so don't get scared by it. Uh, the idea is if you have a bunch of microservices that you've written, and you have one calling A calling B calling C calling D, and something goes wrong in D, uh, in today's world, you have to program the recovery of that all the way through. So we are building a, a mechanism. So if you're going from Ballerina to Ballerina, at least it'll happen magically. And you don't have to program anything. It'll just correct itself, and nothing will have to be done at a programmer level. So again, making it easier to, uh, to make programs that work more reliably. Uh, security is an important one. This is, again, a slightly unusual thing. Uh, most programming languages don't take security into account in the language design. Perl is a little bit unusual. Perl has something called taint checking which helps you track data that came over a network or some kind of unsecure source and forces you to validate that the data is good before you can chuck it into something like a database. Uh, so we want to build in a bunch of capabilities like that, authentication, authorization, uh, the idea of a credential, the idea that somebody is actually running this code and that means there is some permission involved. Those kind of concepts we are, we are trying to build into the language. We, again, not there yet, and this is stuff we're working on right now. Uh, parallelism, a, a, uh, the interesting thing about programming languages is that they're completely screwed up when it comes to the way the world works. The world is completely parallel. Here we have you know, a couple of hundred people here, everybody is doing their own thing, and all kinds of things happen in parallel. But when it comes to programming languages, almost every programming language forces you to start with the sequential thing, and going to parallel programming is a, is a major task. Even in Java, where it's kind of cleanly done with threads, uh, it's still painful to go and create a parallel program. Uh, in Ballerina, because it's a sequence diagram model, the concept of parallelism is fundamentally inherent. A sequence diagram means you draw one line and another line, then it's parallel, that's it. Right? And you write the code exactly with that model. You don't think twice about drawing two lines. In Java, to draw, in a, draw that second line, you have to do a lot of work. And the second line is not the same as the first line. So we've done a whole bunch of things with trying to make that work and trying to make the, the semantics of that work in an in a interesting way. Uh, so there's a bit of funky semantics for, for parallel workers of a function. Uh, we'll see how that how it gets it right, how, how it'll pan out. Uh, <coughs> the, the async stuff in Ballerina is still not quite right. We, we are working on making it better and, and trying to make it a, a even completely natural for asynchronous handling of parallel responses as well. Uh, of course, a programming language is not just a programming language. There's a whole library of functions you have to create that are available for programmers to use when they do something. Uh, so we have a standard library. So uh, there's a bunch of server and client connectors for the stuff you'd expect, HTTP, HTTP2, uh, a bunch of messaging protocols, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Web sockets, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> there's also an I.O. library. Again, I.O. is something in the world of integration you have to do all the time, yet in most languages doing I.O., or in most ESBs, uh, including ours, doing some I.O. in the middle of an integration is really painful. Uh, we are taking great pains to try to make that absolutely natural within the system so that you don't have to go out of the world in order to do I.O., which is like a fundamental thing, obviously. <clears throat> and a bunch of other useful stuff that we are, we are trying to put into the uh, standard library. Uh, uh, and, and then, uh, uh, 
programming life cycle. So, so when you write code, you don't just write a bunch of code and you're done with it. You write code these days, you write some automated testing, you write some documentation, uh, you might build a Docker image for it, you have to have versioning, you have imports and you have dependency management. All of that has to be done to make a programming system these days. So Ballerina is not just a programming language, it's a complete programming system that covers all of these tools. So we have a documentation generation architecture, we have a new testing model, uh, there's a full versioning model, there's a whole bunch of tools we're working on, and also deep Docker integration. Uh, so trying to make the, the life of the program, a program a, a much more natural for the whole cycle, right? Not just write a program and just stop at that. Uh, we've learned a lot from Go in this, by the way. Go has got this really nicely done, uh, and we are learning a lot from how Go is doing it and, and, and uh, uh, being inspired by it. <coughs> um, the way we execute uh, uh, Ballerina programs is, is the following. So we, you have a Ballerina program, you compile it to an object file, you link it, and then you run it, and, a, um, uh, and, and it runs. Right? So this Ballex uh, and the Ballo format, we have a bytecode format we've defined for Ballerina, and then we interpret that bytecode format. But just to be very, very clear, there is no connection between Ballerina and, uh, and Java. Right? We have no benefits from Java coming into Ballerina. Uh, the, the semantics of Ballerina are designed completely natively for Ballerina. There are no Java semantics that have been allowed to leak in. We're very, very careful about that. Ballerina is not targeted for Java developers. It is not targeted for .NET developers. It's targeted for anybody who wants to write networked applications. Right? It's a completely new way of doing things. Uh, we are writing them in Java right now because it's a cool language. It works for us. We are, we are quite familiar with Java. We've written a whole bunch of things. We've done some other stuff in Go, but this one we wrote in Java. Uh, right now, uh, there, there is a concept called native in Ballerina as well. If you want to write some function and you want to write the implementation outside of Ballerina, there is a keyword called native you can use. The only binding we've done right now is for Java, but that's an internal thing. We don't encourage other people to use native stuff at this point. Uh, we're also looking at uh, compiling directly all the way down to a native, native binary. Uh, that's kind of the way of the future now. Even Java 9 has something called ahead of time, compi ahead of time compiling. Um, and we want to go all the way down to an actual native binary so you get full performance. Uh, there's something called LLVM, so we're trying to evaluate between LLVM or there's another thing called Graal uh, and, and various other options. There are many ways in which we can skin this cat. So if you are interested in this stuff and you are familiar with this stuff, we would certainly appreciate uh, help in, in this regard. Uh, it is an open source project. Ballerina is 100% open source. There is a, a, a uh, I forgot to put the GitHub URL, but you can find it. Uh, there's a, a Google group that we use for all the discussions. Uh, and, and all the code is completely public. There is no, nothing that is not open source. So we would love to have you try it. Uh, give us feedback, and if you find some problems, send us a patch. If you want to contribute, we welcome participation and uh, help make Ballerina a great programming language. All right, so that's my summary of Ballerina. So let me kind of switch uh, topics a bit and uh, talk about how Ballerina is fitting into our products. Uh, because this is something I think a bunch of people have asked, saying what does this mean and how does it impact the products. So I'll take each one very briefly and cover it. Um, API Manager version 3. It's awesome, by the way. It's coming up. It's awesome. It's going to be the most awesome API manager ever. Um, most beautiful API manager ever. Um, it has some really cool features. One of them is this concept of API composition that lets people who are using multiple APIs from a particular API host combine them at the host itself and use it as a single custom API. Uh, that's called API composition. It's really powerful. It's, very, it's really nicely done. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be very useful. A, uh, it also, we've had a lot of trouble in, in, in our current version of the API Manager, honestly, the way we do multiple environment stuff is not that great. Uh, with version 3, we've got it significantly uh, cleaned up in, in a very simple model with labels, so you can have any number of environments, any number of different uh, geography-specific gateways, whatever way you want, uh, can be configured with the API Manager version 3. It also supports full micro deployments. So if you want to have a single micro gateway, one API gateway per service, or whatever architecture, fully supported, and, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Oh, it, and it does use Ballerina in the gateway. Right? So, so this is a, a. I just want to point. The main reason I put the first part is to point out that API Manager version three is a new version of the API Manager first. It happens to be using Ballerina in the gateway, and the way it uses Ballerina is that uh, the the actual 
the, when you write the APIs, when you write the composition, or when you write some sequencing, or what happens when an API call comes into the gateway, that logic is written in Ballerina. And in fact, we have programmed the gateway itself in Ballerina. So this is one of our internal test cases for Ballerina. I don't want to say test case because it's going to give people the wrong feeling. This is one of our production use cases for Ballerina, is that the API gateway itself is a complete Ballerina program, right? Uh, and it's written 100% in Ballerina. Uh, and, and what it does for users is that because it has a much more intuitive way of programming than the previous one, uh, and it will have the composer plugged in, it will make the ability to customize and tune what you do within the gateway much, much easier than it was before. Uh, EI7, Enterprise Integration 7. This one has significant impact. We are basically replacing the current ESB and the data services capabilities with Ballerina. Right? Ballerina covers both of those and does a lot more than uh, uh, a lot more than what ESB and DSS are capable of doing in terms of data integration or service integration or message integration. There is a migration tool we are working on to help migrate existing configurations to the new one. Uh, to Ballerina syntax. Uh, it'll take a lot of the pain away. It won't take all of the pain away. I would be lying here if I said, ah, oh, no, you just press a button and it's going to be great. No, the, it'll, our hope is that it'll take a significant part of the complexity of moving from an old version to a new version, but there will be some work that has to be done. Um, so there were, this question came up a bunch of times from people saying, oh, does this mean I have to use both them together? No, of course not. The EI version 7 is a, is a new version of Enterprise Integration version 6. And the way the API gateway and the ESB talk to each other is through open standards, HTTP, normal HTTP kind of stuff. So there's no coupling between the two whatsoever. And you don't have to marry the two together or buy or adopt both at once or anything like that. Another question that came up is, does this mean now I have to go to microservices? Because we talk a lot about how wonderful the world of microservices is going to be, and that API Manager version 3 is all about microservices, et cetera. And the answer to that is absolutely not, and, and EI7. You can continue to use these products in normal, traditional server mode if you want. If you want to bring up a VM and bring up an instance of Ballerina and chuck a bunch of services into it and have it behave like an ESP, it absolutely happily will do that. Right? Or if you want to bring up the API Manager version 3 and treat it the same way you deploy the current API Manager, it will absolutely happily do that. Right? So there's no need to go all micro um, if you don't want to go there. If you want to go there, these products are 100% micro architecture friendly. Not only micro architecture friendly, they are designed for microservices, serverless deployment, and all of those kind of things. Right? Uh, and as far as I know, we're the only one who really have that level of uh, deep marriage to microservices architecture in a native form in the product itself. So many people are using ESB and EI6 and so forth. No, it's not gone. We are continuing to improve it. We have customers who ask for features, and we are pushing features out. And, and we continue to put out multiple uh, minor releases of the product. Uh, the major release obviously is not going to happen again. The major release is EI7. But because this product is so widely deployed, we are going to continue to improve it and, and enhance it and, and add support uh, and, and add capabilities as time goes along. And of course, it'll be supported as long as you want. That's it. Uh, what about the others? I don't know. Uh, we haven't figured it out yet. Uh, when we do, we'll tell you. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, with uh, Identity Server, there are interesting ways in which you can use Ballerina to configure some of the uh, custom identity configurations that you have to do as the identity admin. Uh, how it impacts DAS and IoT and so forth, we don't know yet. We, we, will, we, will, we will, we'll figure it out as we go along, and, and possibly it won't impact at all. Uh, it, it doesn't solve problems related to that, therefore it doesn't matter. <coughs> so. That said, what should you do today? How, how do you get ready and how do you start moving forward? So once again, very, very important. You don't have to stop buying the products that we have today. There's nothing wrong with them. They work perfectly. They're awesome products. Uh, but if you are using them, I have a few things that I think you should be careful about. Number one, ESB, uh, the ESB in, uh, is, has this thing called class mediators. Class mediators are a way of running a bit of Java code uh, within the ESP, when something happens and message comes in through the ESP and the class media runs. Uh, those things are basically black box from our perspective, from a migration tool perspective, from the ESP's perspective. Like, I'm going to call some interface, something happens, an answer comes out, and I carry on with it. So we can't convert those uh, in the tool, right? So um, the more you do class mediators, the more work you have to do to migrate that stuff to, uh, to Ballerina. But the good news there is, a lot of the times you go to a class mediator because the ESP language isn't powerful enough to let you do what you want to do. 
90% of those, my bet will be handled directly from Ballerina. That you can just write a little bit of Ballerina code. It'll do what you were doing in the class media. So it'll be much easier. And then sometimes it's because you want to use a third-party Java library that does something, and you want to you need to include that in in your processing. Uh, then there are different solutions. So, so if there are completely third-party Java things, our proposal is to use uh, make that into a separate microservice and call that as part of the flow. And we'll, we'll come. We'll give you a lot more detail on that as we go along. Uh, the second, of course, is a. Uh, ESP has this thing called properties that you often use to do magical behavior. If you want to make it, you know, flip something on here and something happens there kind of behavior. Eh, avoid that as much as you can, right? And the more you do that, the more difficult it is to, to migrate because they are not really cleanly transparent as to what's happening. Uh, API uh, M users, really there's no impact as such because the API manager, if you're using the API manager in normal API management mode, you don't do much within the API gateway. And that's the recommended deployment architecture. The API gateway should be just an API gateway. You don't program lots and lots of logic into that. Uh, in that case, there's no real challenge. You just you know, migrate the API to the new one, and you're done. Uh, but if you are writing a bunch of things in there, uh, again, uh, avoid Java code, uh, and, and, and don't, don't hack too much in there. Uh, if you're doing multiple environment stuff right now, you're using check-in, check-out. That'll work fine, because once you check out, we can just migrate that version to the new one. Uh, so, so the summary is to, to, to be ready to go forward with, the, with Ballerina as we go along. Uh, don't go crazy. Stay within the boundaries. Play nice. Then it'll be fine. All right. So uh, finally, uh, uh, to conclude, uh, uh, um, Tyler talked about APIs, events, and streams at the beginning uh, of the conference in the opening talk about how these three things are fundamental to how the world is going to evolve and how we are going to have to program in order to support the world uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in making a, this really adaptive enterprise architecture that we, want, we all want to have. Uh, Ballerina currently supports the idea of a main program and a network service. Uh, they have first class, we have first class support for both of those use cases, and it's very cleanly designed to support that. Uh, we are working on a project to try to build a long-running version of Ballerina. This would be like a, a workflow replacement. Uh, so workflow systems, I'm one of the original authors of the Beepel spec, and Beepel uh, is a, uh, a specification that defines how to do very complex workflows. And again, uh, it works perfectly fine, but it's very heavy and complicated. Now we're trying to come up with a much more lightweight way of doing that for long-running processes. Uh, and, and so there's a project we're doing to try to come up with an architecture for that. Uh, and similarly, there's events and streams. So there's some stuff that we think we can do to bring these things together with, uh, we have a system called Siddhi, which is the core of the, the, the streaming, for the, the data analytics server. We're working to figure out what's the right way to bring all of these things together. So we have a, a holistic answer for how to do APIs, streams, and events, as uh, Tyler talked about at the first, on, in the first day. Uh, in the end, this, uh, what Ballerina really is trying to do is make it easier to do what microservices encourages you to think about, which is this concept of smart endpoints and dump pipes. The idea that the endpoint that you're talking to does the bulk of the work, and that you don't have somebody in the middle, some complex ESB-like thing, that does a lot of the logic. Right? The, the guy at the end is smart, and you have a little pipe that connects them together. Uh, it's hard to do because of all these problems that we've talked about. So Ballerina is trying to make that easier. So it's the aspects of the type system, uh, resiliency and parallelism are really all about that, right? So that's, that's fundamentally what we are trying to achieve. Um, uh, finally, I just want to note, of course, creating a winning language is really hard. We know that. Uh, and if you look at the history of programming languages, that's pretty much a list of languages that people use. Uh, and, and if your favorite one is not there, I apologize. But uh, you know, Fortran, COBOL, C, C++, they all came with a certain generational shift. Right, so COBOL was the mainframe, Fortran was how computing started, uh, C was the, the idea of that everybody should be able to program, C++ was saying, well, bring in the concepts of uh, how do you deal with complex programs by object orientation, Java was a cleanup of all of that in some sense, uh, C Sharp was a slight cleanup of Java, uh, JavaScript was for the web, uh, and Python uh, was sort of, uh, you know, this compile build cycle is too painful, let's create a new language that's interpreted. Uh, and, and Go, of course, is a new iteration of essentially Java, in, in my view. Uh, so there's a whole, you know, it takes a long time. And if you look at any one of these languages before they became kind of mainstream, it took about a decade, right? Uh, but we, we see 
the conditions that are necessary for a new language to come into existence, uh, uh, we believe that, that those conditions are present again, uh, which are this combination of sort of fast boot, low memory, the, the idea of networks all over the place, network is uh, uh, completely uh, embedded into the program, uh, everything small, and so forth, are not well su su uh, supported by the existing programming languages. So that is why we believe there is an opportunity to create a new programming language. We didn't go about this problem saying, well, let's go create a new programming language. We really did go about this problem saying, how do we make integration great again? Right? How do we make it so that the problems that our customers, you guys, are solving can be made a lot more productive, a lot more adaptive, a lot more agile, not take six weeks to write something you know, and get it to work, but take six hours to write something, an hour to get it to work, and then you're done. Uh, and it's to do that, the conclusion we came to was you have to address these problems at a much deeper level. And that's why we are creating a programming language. Uh, in the end, I, I want to point out this is a long-term effort. Uh, you know, it takes a, a, so I, one of the reasons that Tyler came on board and I switched gears is I'm going to focus on, on Ballerina and, and getting the core of the language and the architecture uh, designed for a very long-term uh, thinking. And, and uh, I love this quote because it basically says, you know, to do long-term stuff, there is a price, which is a bit of short-term pain. And that part of short-term pain, unfortunately, is going to land on you guys. Uh, but we believe that the result will be so awesome and powerful that it's fully worth the pain. Thank you very much. <laughs>